There is nothing in this world that I enjoy more than having somebody fascinating over to my kitchen and mixing it up. Paul, I am so excited to have you here. Uh, you are tech, you're, you're technically the first guest here, so I'm, I'm just very, very excited. We have one <laughs> little trial, and um, but I always knew from the beginning when I knew I was going to do this that you were going to be one of my first guests. I didn't know wow. you would be the, the first, but I said around the first. So. Um, I'm just really honored to have you here. I'm grateful that you're here. I've always enjoyed our conversations, and I obviously love your soju. Um, so your last name is spelled, is pronounced how? Nakayama. Nakayama. So yeah. tell me about, where, what's the roots of that? Where you, you, you yeah. did not grow up in Japan, or you? That's right, I grew yeah. up here, okay. uh, born and raised here. Uh, my parents came over from Japan uh, when, when they were in their late 20s or okay. so. Uh, my father was a travel agent for Korea Airlines. Oh, wow. He's from Tokyo, near the fish markets. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know. You would love it yeah. there. Um, my uncle, who passed away, used to work the fish markets for like... his brother? Mm -hmm. His older brother used to work the fish markets for 50, 60 years. Until How many turned. brothers and sisters did your dad have? He has three brothers and an older sister, and he's the youngest. Okay, he's the youngest. Yeah, he's the youngest. So you said three brothers? And three brothers and an older sister. So there's a, a, a five... Wow. Five kids right. in that family, yeah. Oh, just so you know, this so this is uh, a saffron infused, just sparkling water, uh, and I put a little bit of fresh yuzu in there too. That's beautiful. So, yeah, it's a beautiful uh, saffron. It's a local saffron from Peace and Plenty up in Sacramento. You know, I always love how much you contrast colors, you know, in your in your drinks. Oh, thank yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, mm, beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's so I love it. It's refreshing. So I did, you know, I'm working on my new menu for what I'm doing and. I, this is going to be the this is the new opening water. Oh, but nice! I, you know, I know you when you came to my restaurant. I think I had three different waters. Yeah, you probably don't remember, but I'm not sure uh, if you do. But, a lot of different infusions. So that's still a big part of what I do. You know what I mean? So, uh, okay, so you um, you were born here. Your mom. So your father's from Tokyo, and your mom is from where? Uh, Kagoshima, Kagoshima, which is the southern part of Japan. Okay. And it's essentially kind of the most famous place for shochu. Okay, excellent. Um, but, you know, when my mom used to tell me about Kagoshima, I never really connected that, you know, at all. Yeah. Didn't know about the history of, of shochu really until I got into it. And her family, what were they, what, what were they when they uh, were they? Farmers, okay. mostly what farmers. Kind of farm? I don't know. Farm? All I know is that my mom grew up around a lot of animals and farming, and, and uh, she had to do a lot of the help. Yeah. And she's the youngest also um, in her family. Um, she had a big family as well, five, six kids. Right. Wow. So yeah. both of them came from five or six kids. Mm -hmm. And you, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have a younger sister. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're, we're a pretty small family. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious, like, because this is a thing that comes up for me, and I'm definitely older than you, but um, how much of, like, the feeling of um, that whole ancestry of your parents, like the farming, uh, how much of that was really carried over when you came here? Like, you know, you, mm. you, you grew up in L.A., Obviously, uh, there are farms here outside, don't get me wrong, but I mean, if you're living in L.A., you're growing up very differently than how your parents grew up. Yep. And I know for me, you know, one of the things I, my grandparents were, have, you know, were Greek, and I used to, when I went to their home, it's almost like they recreated Greece there. Uh, so that's what I loved about it, you know what I mean? Yeah, so it was yeah, like yeah. they had everything that they were growing there, and they had, you know, chickens, and they would go get local lamb, you know, so... It was all before people just did that. It wasn't right. like, oh, I, I'm so conscious of having to do that. So was there any of that that kind of trickled down into you? Or you is know, it hard to say? Or, or, does it, or is it something that appeared later on in life? Uh, my interest in it definitely came later in life. Mm -hmm. um, I would get hints of, of what their lives were like prior to coming to L.A. But once my parents moved to L.A., I think they were all about trying to find a way to fit in. Mm. and getting us to be not more Americanized, but more, you know, acclimated. Yeah. They didn't want us to have trouble, you know. Um, and was there a lot of concern about that because of where they came from and, I mean, how... No, I mean, my dad was a pretty... Com he, he is a pretty confident guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, never, he never shows fear, essentially. Um, but I think, you know, they just, they just wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be any problems because neither of them were native English speakers. And so they had to learn it as they went along. And eventually my sister and I became the main translators for the family, oh, okay. right? And is their English fine now, or do they never really kind of... My father's is not bad, yeah. uh, pretty good. My mom's is better than she gives herself credit for. Yeah. But she doesn't have the confidence in it that would require her to speak it more often. And what kind of work were they able to do here when they came here? Uh, so my father first started off as a travel agent. Uh -huh. 
Um, and so he then, still traveled a lot? or Back then. Back then. Yeah, back then. Uh, and then uh, they opened a nightclub. Oh, my, really? Yeah, in uh, what is now Koreatown, um, way, way back. What it was, was it called? It was before? called Club Niji, and Niji means rainbow. Okay. And uh, it was one of the first kind of Japanese-style uh, hostess clubs. Okay. Um, and a uh, hostess club is basically a Japanese-style bar where you, know, you have bottle service, you have pretty girls sit and talk with you. Mm-hmm. It's nothing, you know, seedy or sexual. Um, did that develop? Did either people do stuff like that, though? Where they had clubs like that and they did kind of cross the line? There probably are. Yeah, but um, back then, I'm wondering. Oh, back then. Oh, do I don't think, know. Yeah. I mean, there are clubs where, uh, you know, I think they earned that reputation. Yeah. Um, but most of the clubs I started to hear, I think they just wanted to bring that culture, culture here mm-hmm. because you have a lot of... Back then, especially, you know, people from Honda and Toyota and all the executives yeah. from Japan that wanted their nightlife culture to be represented here as well. Interesting, yeah. And so they brought that over. Did, do you, and is that something that's still around now or not really? Not their particular establishment? No, I mean, most, of, most of them have gone away simply because, um, you know, a lot of the Japanese companies have, have moved on to different states. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Toyota's not here anymore, Nissan's not here anymore. Where did they move? I believe Tennessee, Texas. Oh. Texas, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically out of state um, to save costs, and so a lot of the you know the smaller shops basically closed down. A lot of the smaller bars closed down. Yeah, uh, and there's still some that remain. Um, and so my mom basically was in that industry forever. Like after my mom and my father got divorced. Oh, so they did get divorced. Mm-hmm. Well, how old were you? Uh, around seven. Wow. Yeah, yeah. my dad went to Hawaii. Uh, Is he still there? Uh, he's there now, yeah. yeah. He did. He was a sushi chef for 30, 30 years or so, I want to say. Oh, wow. Yeah. In Mao? Uh, Oahu. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then my mother basically was in the, the bar industry for the rest of the time oh, because that was the only yeah. school she had. So that's where you get it from. So that's, that was kind of, and that was your influence to be around alcohol and to want to go into business? I mean, no, how is yeah. it? I mean, I know, tell us about, because I know the story about obviously meeting your wife and having and how did you get into soju and this soju yeah. and how did that all come about so I'll, I'll go back to the first point because it was really interesting where um, when I was growing up the last thing I wanted to do was alcohol yeah that's you know? I, I relate to that yeah right I mean I think we've spoken spoke, spoke about this before but you know our relationship and what with was alcohol that changed. because you were around it so much and it just seemed like a, not a, a happy business to you or yeah I mean you know I, I wondered at times, if if alcohol had something to do with, you know, why my mom and dad got divorced, um, I don't think I was necessarily the case. But yeah. I always felt there was that influence there. Yeah, that's that's a that's a big pain. Um, when I was that definitely was the case for my parents. Oh yeah. Yeah, my mom was a huge alcoholic, and I always felt that they had a really pretty good relationship. And when she really got to a point where she was drinking too much, that definitely I don't think anybody would have been able to handle. Yeah, so I mean, isn't I, that isn't that strange yeah, how yeah. how we kind of reclaim the things that we it's so fast distance ourselves from you know? Yeah, I really distanced myself from it as well. It was I couldn't even smell it on somebody's breath. That's how dramatic it was for me. You know what I mean? Um, and this lasted for a long time for you, right? Like, how at what age did yeah, you because, switch over? Well, they, I mean, I was conscious of her drinking definitely when I was sixty. I remember one time, you know, I was friends with Rodney Dangerfield's son. Oh, were you really? Yeah, uh, way way back. Oh my god, such okay. A character. And it was really interesting because we became friends. I, w- I came out for the summer. I was here in L.A. and we met. And we met, I think we met in acting class. He didn't tell me for a long time who he, who he was and stuff like that. But he was a, we just had a great relationship. But he came home to my home in Boston. And my parents were there. And it's like, I remember like, they went and left the room. He goes, do you know your mom's an alcoholic? He just said that to me, just like that. But it's out of the blue. His mom died of alcoholism. Oh my god! And his father was a huge pot smoker. All of that, right? But when he said to me, it was it was really interesting. It's like I never really saw it. it I didn't really, I didn't make that connection of like she's an alcoholic. I just thought, oh, she's drinking and da 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 da. But um, he says, you know, your mom's an alcoholic, and I could tell it made him uncomfortable. It wasn't just an observation. Right. And it wasn't until that moment that I really started to step back and see. And then it was like, oh, my God, I saw the whole like blueprint of it in, in a snap like that. You know, and I was much older. You were young. So I think it's, you yeah. know, I try to think of my kids are eight years old. So to think about that, I mean, they went through a separation, obviously, with us. But that was about four years ago. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so that was a thing. It was it was one of those weird, weird things that I didn't even know my mom was an alcoholic. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, growing up, um, everyone in my family on my dad's side definitely loves alcohol. Yeah. I remember uh, there was a thermos in in the cabinet that had uh, these anime robots on it. And so as, as a little kid, I always wanted that thermos because it's so cool looking. But when you oh, open you it... Oh, you saw them from other people had them, not you? No, no, I mean, it was in our house. Oh, like, oh, there was like okay. a thermos okay. in our house and yeah. I always wanted to use it. But whenever you open it, it would, sell, it would be so <laughs> smelly because they, you know, my grandfather was using it to store alcohol, I think, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so it was unusable. Yeah. At the time, I didn't know what it was, but as I grew older, I realized what it was. And, yeah. and I remember, you know, thinking that alcohol was bad, mm-hmm. you know, only bad people drink it. Yeah. I didn't drink it in high school. I didn't yeah. drink it in college. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then once I started, once when I graduated. When did you first drink, have your first drink? Uh, when I turned 21 in college, my, my, my roommates made, you. made me drink. Yeah. And uh, it was not a good experience. But um, uh, when I joined my first company out of college, it was a Japanese company. And back then especially, uh, there was a culture of not hazing necessarily, but pretty close. Yeah. Where the boss would say, "Hey, we're gonna go drinking tonight. And you can't say no. Yeah. You know, you're drinking until two a.m. and then back to the office at seven. Yeah, so it's so interesting that you say that. I, you know, I never went to college. I never really experienced that whole thing. Um, but I do remember the same thing. Being in high school, I wouldn't go out because people were drinking or smoking pot. You know, I just wouldn't go out. So everyone thought I was antisocial, <laughs> or that I, I thought, right. that, or they thought that I thought that I was better than them. Oh, I see. That's what was. What was how, that's how they turned it around. It. But, you know, it's so funny. I, w- I went, uh, spent like a month or a summer program in France when I was 16 years old, I remember. And um, I stayed, in, it was a little town outside of Bordeaux called Cadillac. And I, we, I stayed with a French family. I, you know, that's when I, I was pretty good at French at the time. But um, I remember he was, they were drinking Malibu rum. And okay. I, and he kept on and I wouldn't drink it. He's like, you're not going to be my friend if you don't drink. Oh, man. And I still didn't drink it. That's how strong <laughs> I was. I said, I didn't care. You know what I mean? Right. And he really treated me different. He, he lived in my, he was the people where I lived in my, their family. Wow. So I felt, not by the family, but he and his friends kind of ostracized me after that, you know? But I didn't have my first drink until we did go into a Paris nightclub. And my friend from Brooklyn, she gave me a sip of her gin and tonic, and I remember loving it. Oh. And she was like, but you're not going to have it. Because she knew that I w- didn't really drink it. She didn't want to corrupt me, I, I think she felt. Mm. But it was the first time I had a sip, but then I never really drank again until I was... Oh, no, that's not true. I mean, I drank later on. And same thing. I, I think I went to the extreme for a short period of time. Yeah, same, same for me. I mean, I think I was afraid of how my brain would react to it. Yeah. That I would love it too much or something, yeah. you know? I th- yeah. Because um, I do have an addictive personality when it comes to, like geeky things like comic books and video games, you know, but yeah. not Are to you alcohol. a big video gamer? Oh, yeah. I love video games. I love, wow. I mean, I love anything where there's something being produced or created. Mm-hmm. I think I've always loved because I love that someone came up with something that entertains. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really curious this because um, I had this philosophy. I just feel like I wish video games and sugar was never created. You know, like when I see my kids, no, yeah. seriously. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It's like playing with this stuff. It kills me. I mean, I just see, like, it, to me, it's like their brain cells are being killed. Um, I just feel like their personality changes. Is it something that you did at a very young age, and then you kept doing it, or you developed it later? Or Because some people, I yeah. think, grow out of that phase. Yeah. You know? And then there's I, people I definitely have met who are like, they just, they love it. Um, I definitely started early. I think uh, whenever Atari came out, I yeah, remember, my mom. Yeah, I had Atari, okay. My mom got for Christmas. But was it an escape, or was it a real obsession and addiction? It wasn't an addiction, or at least something I would call an addiction, until maybe college. Okay. I mean, I remember there were there were days where my roommates and I were just playing video all games, day. yeah, all day instead and of. What 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 was that about though? Because you had obviously you had school and you had yeah. other things and. Uh, well, it's interesting because we've lived we're living in these times where. There and you these... don't seem like someone that would be that way, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Not that I'm not, it's not a judgment, it's just, I just, I, I don't know, I just never pictured that. Yeah, I mean, um, so, you know, we're living in this, this amazing time where there are these huge technology leaps every few years, and they were farther and fewer between when we were younger. You know, from Atari to Super Nintendo took a long time. Yeah, I you remember. Know? From Super Nintendo to PlayStation took a long time. Yeah. 
So when these things happened and you're seeing them happen when at, at an age when we're still into that stuff, yeah. it was really exciting, you know, like you would see like, you know, it would be like going from a, a stick figure to a fully rendered character in a matter of, you know, 15, 20 years. And it just didn't seem plausible or possible. And to, and to see it happening and knowing that there was somebody out there working on it and creating not, the techn- not only the technology, but these stories and these so that's characters. what you got attracted to. It's Absolutely, like, yeah. yeah. There's so much, I can't believe this was even created. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, it's entertainment. It's yeah. a different kind of entertainment. Yeah. Um, but I've always been really into books and movies and, and yeah. TV I and I comics. I definitely and, was yeah. into it. I mean, I love movies. I watched a lot of movies all the time. Definitely an obsession. But the video games, I, you know, I grew up in Cambridge and Bo- in Belmont and Boston. There was an arcade we would go to, and I remember that. And I loved it. And I even remember when I was younger, I wanted an Atari, and I guess my my mom saw me one day. We were in a car, and I was playing on a CB radio. So they got me a CB radio instead, and I cried. Oh! I thought I was getting the Atari. (laughs) (laughs) So the next year, I got the Atari, but I couldn't believe I didn't get the Atari. What makes you think I wanted the CB radio? And she goes, "Well, you were so yeah." So so there was something about it, and I would play it, but. What happened was I feel like it lost an interest for me. You know what I mean? I wasn't that w- movies definitely not. I mean, I watched movies all the time. We used to go to New York. We would call we would call it Plexix, and we would bring all of our food. And up on fifty and between eight and ninth, there was a theater, and you could go from movie to movie to movie. So you would go oh, to yeah. the earliest one and stay stay and all just, day. Yeah, just stay all day and pay one ticket. Totally. Yeah, we used to call that Plexix. So I love that. But um, yeah, so I don't know. I, just, I don't know. Should I be worried about my voice? No, I mean I think. What it is is they'll each get out of it what they are into. Mm-hmm. So for me, I think what I pulled out of it eventually was um, the love of puzzles, the love of story. And that love of story is, I think, kind of what led me into Nankai. Because for me now, story is such a huge part of everything I do. Yeah. You know, And you don't know all these things that you're doing as a child or as a teenager or as a young adult have an impact into how you're going to be today. I know, it's wild. But I think everything happens for a reason, yeah. strangely. Yeah. You know, the universe makes these connections and I these dots. I agree with that. Yeah, so I wouldn't be worried. I'm, you've, got, you've got great boys. Okay. They're going to be fine. <laughs> so talking about that, though, so let's talk about the story of Nankai. And I want to, oh, yeah. uh, let me give you some drinks, too. But um, So tell me about what Nankai means, which is funny, because I remember when you, when, I, when you first met one of my sons, his name was Kai, you're like, that, that's, Nankai, right. that's in the name of my soldier. Yeah. Um, so the name, the origin, I know, you know, I, I want to hear about that and how this kind of all came about. Yeah. You know, and obviously now is the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> well, I apologize, because I, I, this story gets kind of long and I can get kind of passionate about no, talking about okay. it, so feel free to change the subject well, anytime. Well, what I think I'll do is, while you're starting to talk, let me at least cook the first thing here. Oh, yeah. And then I'll make a drink, but we're, I'm just going to be back and forth here. Perfect, so, yeah. Okay? Yeah, totally. Okay. So, so, uh, so, yeah, my wife and I got married about seven years ago. Okay. And she is from uh, this archipelago of islands called Amami. Okay. And Amami has this rich history. It's in the middle between Okinawa and uh, the main island of Japan. And in between the main island? Yeah, it's, so it's this, it's a, I thought it, it's the southernmost yeah. uh, island of Japan, right? Yeah, so if you've got Japan here, yeah. you've got Okinawa somewhere around here, like 200 kilometers to the south. Yeah. And then a little bit above that is Amami. Oh, wow, okay. And there's a yeah. string of islands. So it's actually closer to Okinawa than it is to the main island. Okay. Um, and it was kind of a, a, a strategic location way, 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 way back in those old days when the samurais were around and trading was around. And, and so it was used as a... Um, an island to grow sugarcane, as a as a as a as a you know a cash crop essentially. Is that so? It wasn't something that was indigenous to that island. They actually brought it in and harvested it and, and kind of expanded it. That I'm not sure, but I imagine so. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, the island is essentially kind of like Hawaii. Yeah. Um, in, oh, so it's, tropical it's very tropical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, beautiful place. Yeah. And I, so I would love we. To go there. Oh my God, you would yeah. love it. Yeah, I would love it. And, and the great thing about it is there are these. Um, there are eight islands in total, but only six that are kind of the main inhabited islands. Uh-huh. The other two are like research islands, which is where we actually got uh, the idea for our logo. So we, our logo is a hexagon, and that hexagon represents the six main islands of Amami. Oh, I never knew that. Yeah. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, and the, um, so the six main islands, and there are different kind of 
things about each island. So for example, um, there is an island called Yakushima. Uh -huh. It's a um, um, UNESCO heritage site. And it's this beautiful, like, mountainous island with thousand-year-old cedar trees, mm. uh, moss everywhere. Oh, moss is one of my favorite things. In and the world. it's it's basically this this really scenic place that you just can't get out of your mind if you ever go there. And I highly re recommend going. Uh, there's well, another so island. Just so you know, you oh, yeah. were asking me about this. What did you think that was? I thought it was a, a current tomato or something. Yeah. That's a type of persimmon. That's called a lotus persimmon. This is a persimmon? That's a persimmon on a branch. You're going to take that branch home with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And that's kind of what I use for people sitting now. It's called a lotus persimmon. And it's, it, it's very much, when it's ripe, sweet potato-y raisin. -y. You're not going to believe it. Really? Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Um, how do I know if it's ripe or when it's ripe? If you turn around and you see those there, you see how they start to get kind of black and custody and soft? Oh, yeah, yeah. No. And I might even have you try one before you go. Oh, here, this is some pomegranate seeds that have been soaked in um, yellow chartreuse. Ooh. And then you can use that as your napkin. Thank I'm you. I'm making a soft shell crab French toast for you with no bread. What? <laughs> that was from my last menu. Um, and um, I, I'm going to take, I want to give you some nips. So I have some different sojus of you that I've, that I've made. Now, this is what. Oh, you, wow. You like that? That's incredible. Cool. Yeah. It's a chartreuse? Yellow chartreuse. And I'm working on doing green too and flaming it before I give it to people and serving it in a half half kind of wow. you know, frozen pomegranate. You know, it's funny. If, if you ever met anyone that did not like chartreuse, um, which was me like five, ten years ago, <laughs> yeah. this would definitely change their minds. Yeah. Oh, really? Excellent. Oh, for sure. That's fantastic. Oh, wow. But one of the things I'm going to tell you that might surprise you or not, so you know I don't really drink, obviously, that much, right? Mm -hmm. And But I would on occasion have like white wine or stuff like that. But guess what? Now I'm into the Nankai Soju. When I say I'm into it, it's the perfect thing for me to drink. And I only have it once in a while, but it's one of the only things I drink now. You've given me so much of it, so I have it. But literally, I'll just put it on a big cube, and I'll, put, I'll squeeze some either yuzu or citrus in it. I just had it on Sunday, too, and I remember um, the mother of my children, she's like, Oh, I like to see you drink like that. I go, she goes, what is that? And she tries, goes, oh my God, this is amazing. She goes, oh, really? what, what did you make? I said, no, 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 it's just the soju. And I poured the citrus on. So I'm so happy that oh, wow. I finally found something that's clean. And it's like, sometimes wine can make me feel like really like drowsy. And this was perfect because it's even a little bit more higher percentage of alcohol and super, super clean. Yeah, I'm so yeah. glad you feel that way. Yeah, uh, no, that's, definitely. That's incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it was actually kind of, that was my experience with it. So when we went on our honeymoon to Amami Island, we went caving. Uh, we were in this tiny little lo local island bar, and, and I saw her this. Her family is still there. Her family. Uh, well, her grandma was there. Her aunts are there. Uh, her father used to work in city government or prefectural government. Okay. And so he would have to travel in between islands every two years, and so they lived on a lot of these different little uh, islands. Excellent. But that was his favorite island. Was Amami? One or? of them. Yeah, Amami is definitely. Yeah, it's. Yeah. It's just incredible. And that was the first when you went on the honeymoon. That was the first time you went. It was the first time I ever heard of it. I never even I heard of it. I didn't hear of it until yeah. you told me about it. I uh, was blown away, and, and that's the only island in Japan that's allowed to make this black sugar shochu. It's, is that the only place that black sugar is? Uh, no, black sugar is probably, so there's, uh, Amami makes it, Okinawa makes it. Okay. Uh, I've heard uh, there are places in Taiwan that make it. Now, when you say make it, make the soju with black sugar or have black sugar? Black sugar. Okay. Is yours the only soju made with black sugar? Excellent. Yeah, That's yeah. So the, uh, there are about 20 or so distilleries on the islands. Uh, and these 20 distilleries are the only ones that are allowed to make black sugar shochu okay. uh, in all of Japan. And it's still a kind of a minor category. You know, the biggest categories of shochu in Japan are like barley or rice yeah. or a sweet potato. Yeah, sweet potato. I always so, thought yeah. that was it. Like, yeah. And is that very Korean as well, the sweet potato one? Uh, it can be. I and mean, they're... They make, they make soju in Korea, right? They do, yeah. But the origin is Japan, though. No. Uh, what is the of it? So the the origin is quite murky. Okay. <laughs> uh, they don't know exactly where it started, and there are a lot of different theories of how shochu started in Japan. But we do know that it's been around for about five hundred years. Yeah. Uh, the most popular theory is that there, were, in Okinawa, five hundred years ago, they were famous for being traders. They were, you know, taking their giant ships and going all these different places and bringing stuff back, and somewhere along the way. 
You know, they either found uh, distilled spirits from Thailand, Korea, uh, Iraq, from, yeah. the, from the Middle East, right? Uh, and brought it back to Okinawa. And from Okinawa, it found its way back into the main island of Japan. And what makes shochu unique is uh, two things, really. One is it has to be single distilled. So it's one of the so only one spirits. Time, then. One time through the still, yeah. yeah. And when you but do that, pot stilled, right? Pot stilled. Yeah. Yeah. And you carry all the flavors of whatever you make it from, you know, obviously because. And is the, is the, is the, is the idea is that um, not all that flavor is there, but do people worry about impurities staying in there and not ha having stuff in it? How does that work? It's interesting that you say that. So the thing is, when you do something single distilled, and because you're going to have all the flavors in there, it's kind of require, it's, a, it's a requirement that you use the highest quality ingredients. Which is kind of a very, very Japanese thing to do anyway. Yeah, you don't really have to say that. <laughs> you know, um, and then it's all about using the best of everything. And single distillation is actually probably one of the cleanest methods of alcohol. And so uh, people often say that shochu will give you less likelihood of, of, of a hangover because mm -hmm. everything's so clean. That's what. It is. That's yeah. probably what I'm responding to. And then the second thing that makes shochu unique is that it uses koji, which is a Japanese oh, type of wow. mold. The, the fermented rice. Yeah, it's basically a, it's a type of mold. Yeah, you know, for yeah. for miso and soy I've sauce. Used that. Yeah, I've yeah. Used that it's an incredible mold, right? And it's so used you for use that. yeah, and that's, that's I never knew the that. fermentation process. Yeah. So that's how you ferment the uh, black the mash. Sugar. So it's basically black sugar, water. What else is in that mash? So we start with rice, yeah. water, koji. Yeah. Uh, and that makes the the koji rice. Okay. And that is added then to uh, you know yeast and and uh, the black sugar. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And then that's, it's the only thing that allows uh, this thing called parallel fermentation. So the koji breaks down the, the rice, uh, the, you know, the transforms the, the sugar or the carbs into sugars. The sugar transforms into alcohol via How the yeast. How long is that process for the soju to, to ferment? Uh, one to two weeks, depending oh, on two the... two weeks. Yeah. 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 And then, then we distill it. Right. And I want to know about the vacuum distill. Oh, right, because yeah. That's what I think. Is that, are you one of the first people to do that? Is that a common thing? How did that come about? Because I never heard about that that much, and I still don't understand exactly the process. Vacuum distillation is essentially this really cool process uh, that was born out of the fact that in Japan... Oops, sorry. sorry. Oh, oh, nice catch. <laughs> <laughs> it was born what? It was born out of the fact that uh, people in Japan were drinking less shochu during a certain period of time. And they realized that women and young adults weren't drinking shochu. And the reason for that is when you have something that's single distilled, it's an acquired taste. You have all the is flavor. Is there a roughness to it too, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Well, Maybe it's, like it's a more, funk or something? There's more of a funk. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like mezcal. Yeah. Mezcal is double distilled. Yeah. Um, and so they realized, okay, people don't want to go to parties and smell like alcohol. And so they came up with this process of using vacuum distillation, which is using low pressure and low heat to create a vacuum inside the still. And when you do that, you drop the boiling point or the evaporation point of alcohol from 178 degrees down to like 113. Oh, wow. And so it's much more gentler on the mash. Yeah. You know, you're getting the alcohol at a much lower temperature. It's much more so does that mean floral and, and fruity. Yeah. Um, so you get the best parts of the alcohol, but not that, that funk that most people don't like. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, if you're a hardcore shochu lover, then you want that <laughs> funk. So yeah. it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of the, the vacuum insulation portion of it. It's also what makes nankai so easy to drink. It's it's so easy to drink. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what blew me away on, on our honeymoon. And so you tried it there, mm -hmm. and right at that point, they were just making it locally for the yeah. island, or were they for the island? Uh, parts of Japan also have it, um, but it's definitely a smaller category. Well, let me just tell you about this Ooh. quickly. So, this is a um, this is a basically a soft shell crab French toast. So basically, there's oh no God. bread in it. But basically, what I did is I took the soft shell crab, I, I put it in egg, and I uh, bread it in pistachios, and then I sautéed it in walnut oil, cinnamon, and salt, and I put this maple syrup that I got from someone's backyard in Michigan. Okay, <laughs> that's so Matthew. Uh, yeah, bananas. We all, <laughs> and then this is your. Uh, Soju gold, nankai gold, with this is what I was going to do for the thing, but it's got um, fresh uh, Blenheim apricots and curry leaves. It's really cool. Oh my so God. I can't wait. I've got a couple of things for you to try, but Kampai. cheers. Thank cheers. you so much. And um, oh, 
Oh, wow. Mm. Mm. That's incredible. I, yeah. I so I thought I was trying to do kind of like a little brunch thing here. The curry leaves is really... Yeah, that's my, one of my favorite flavors. It's more of a sesame flavor than it is... Um, Think of it's not curry, you it's know. Not I mean? curry, People yeah. think it's curry, but it's that sesame flavor. And it's got a really interesting. It also brings like uh, hints of citrus, I think. Definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah it definitely has uh, those those apricots. Oh, the apricots are really, really special. Wow. Thank yeah, you. so I'm interested you to take a bite because yeah. it's just warm. So, um, and like I said, I don't usually join people, so I love that I get to join people. This now. is a treat. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So make sure you get a little bit of banana on there. I love soft shell crab. Mm. Mm. Oh my God. It's a perfect name to soft shell crab French toast. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened. Do you like it? I love it. Yeah. I had, um, you can keep eating. Yeah. So what happened was, this was on my menu, right? And I had the creative director from Goop here, okay, with his wife. Oh, okay. And I made them the soft shell crab. And I, and I just had dinner with them last night, so I told them the story, because I, I, I feel bad because I'm telling everybody this story when I'm doing the dinner. <laughs> But I said to them, like, I made this soft shell crab, and I know you guys loved it, but in my mind, I was like, that has to have cinnamon next time, which is very Greek, right? Mm. Very Greek. We use a lot of cinnamon. But what happened was the first time I served the cinnamon, someone was like, this tastes like French toast. So then I started incorporating the fruit on it. Then I started incorporating the maple syrup. So oh. it took 10 times to get to this. And I don't know if you know those Japanese people that grow those magical grapes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, so yeah. I st that was on top of this for three weeks. I had magical grapes on this. So it was, that was the height. It peaked at magical grapes on top of this. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, I love that your Instagram name, Eat Your Drink, is kind of perfect because it really does capture your philosophy and everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And I like that. I love that you're kind of going both ways now. You're not just making drinks, but you're making food that's like influenced by your drinks. Yeah. I love that. It, my drinks got me into the food. Mm -hmm. That's what I. That's what. Uh, that's what I love about it. And I'm glad that you really see that because it's a natural evolution. But it's also I can't think of drinks without food now. It's impossible. I can't see myself going back to a bar and just making drinks. You know. And I love that too because that's a very, for me, a, a, a cultural thing too. Because in Japan, everything is kind of intertwined that way. Mm -hmm. You know, shochu. I drank a lot of shochu when I was working for that Japanese company because it's just a part of how you enjoy food. And so even though I didn't want to really drink, you know, they were like, no, no, you got you to do the two things together. And so it became part of that. And when I was younger, I didn't like it because I was being forced to. But yeah. now... Everything is different when you're, you're choosing it yeah. yourself. There's a free will involved. Well, and then once we started doing the shochu thing, you know, I really started appreciating the level of craftsmanship and thought that goes into... Not just shochu, but everything. You know, I have so much respect now for. But were you always for... that way, or did was it a turning point where your Japanese hood kind of came to really fruition? I think my appreciation because if you, exponentially if you come, grew. That's what I'm saying. If you come, if you're if you're already Japanese and you have, like you said, an appreciation of using high quality things or beauty and just the things that the Japanese people appreciate, right? It's very different, right? Yeah, and very simplistic in a lot of ways too. Did you have any of that, or do you think it was just like being a little bit of a kid here in LA took you away from that and trying to fit into bit. the culture here, right? Yeah, a little bit. So now when you're isolated on this island, it feels like, oh my God, everything kind of sprouted for you. All of a sudden, the things that I think my mother was trying to teach me about, about food, and my father was teaching me about food, started clicking. Are they really good cooks? Both of them are, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. What kinds of things would they cook for you? My father was always kind of, I mean, obviously he's, a, he's an amazing sushi chef. Yeah. But he was really into tempura. And uh, I remember I worked for him one summer and he wanted me to be in charge of all the tempura. And the way he does it, it's not just putting what batter is it on it. What is it battered in? It's like a really light rice, uh, flour? rice flour, yeah. So it's gluten free. Naturally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's different versions you can do, but I believe that's what we did. And I would love to learn how to make that. I cried. When he made it? Learning how to make it because I was so frustrated that I couldn't get it right away. Mm. And he just threw me into the mix. Like, I was making food for his customers. And, of course, the first, you know, 
how many batches were just completely horrible. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was crying out of frustration, crying out of shame that I was feeding this to people and they were paying money for it. And it was just, it was absolutely awful. And so I was just, and then part what of what made you know, it awful for you? I mean, what, what's the science of really doing a great tempura? Um, I'm no master by any means. Yeah. But the way my father had taught me was I would get batter on my fingers. You would flick it into this hot oil and you would form these little droplets of, of batter. And then you would kind of uh, gather the batter together to form like this bed. And then you would dip your vegetables or your shrimp What's or whatever. What's the oil that you use for that? I believe it was, uh, I think it was some kind of rice oil. Rice bran? Oil? Rice bran oil, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was a high smoking point oil. Mm hmm and then uh, you, would, you would dip the vegetable or whatever in batter. Yeah. And then you would essentially put, lay it on top of this bed of, of pre-made droplets of batter. Oh. And then you would wrap it and form like this nice texture to the tempura. And, and rolling it in that hot oil and trying to form that crust perfectly. Oh, now I understand. Okay, I've, not, I've never seen it made like that. It was so frustrating for me because yeah. I'd never done it before. Is that how you're really supposed to do it or that's how your father does it? That's how my father does it and it's also a style of tempura, I okay. think. So you know, if you go to a lot of different tempura restaurants, they don't necessarily go through that step. Yeah. They'll just have really good batter and really and good... They just deep, do they deep fry it or...? Deep fried, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was an interesting experience for me. But, you know, I think going through that and now doing shochu and, and meeting people like yourself that connects these dots between food and drink mm -hmm. really did open my eyes to a different side of things. And so now, you know, when we do nankai, my whole thing is trying to find different ways of pairing, not just cocktails, but you know, shochu and, and, and alcohol and food to food. And stuff, right, yeah. yeah. I think that's really great. I think that's fantastic. And it also expands it, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you, the people don't feel like they have to make a cocktail with it, you know? Right. Um, but in terms of the, like, what was the time in between you went to that honeymoon, you discovered mm -hmm. that, and when were you actually starting to import it into um, here? And are you, how many states are you in right now? We're in three states now. We're working on expanding to three more next year. Okay. Um, so, so what are you, you're in California? California, Nevada, Nevada and Hawaii. Perfect, yeah. And then, um, so yeah, after I had that drink in Amami, went to the distillery, yeah. took this crazy 12 hour boat ride. And the thing was, I had, I mean, I'm not a, uh, you know, when I was much younger, I was a, I was a binge drinker during my, my 30s, I think, when I first discovered mm -hmm. alcohol, uh, that on my own terms, you yeah, know? yeah. Um, and then I stopped, and then once I hit my 40s, uh, I realized that I would get hangovers really easily, you know. And so when I had nankai and shochu in general, and just didn't get a hangover, I was really kind of impressed. And so I just kept testing the limits on that, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. Not, not, it wasn't healthy by any means, but it was just something I just wanted to test, and I was so intrigued Are with how clean it was. That? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I got it. Thank you. That we went to the distillery and just learned everything we could about how they made everything. Yeah. And then on the flight home, my wife and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And you know, I mentioned that shochu can be kind of funky, right? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of shochu companies in the past have come to the US trying to sell shochu and just haven't done well because of that funkiness. It was just too soon, I think. You know, similarly, mezcal. I think it, it took a while for it to come. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Come into yeah. Into now play. it's like it's it's always amazing to think that so many people like it mm -hmm. that you never thought would like it. Yeah. yeah, it's an acquired taste essentially, right? Yeah. And the same with shochu, but nankai was so easy to drink that on the plane ride home, I kept thinking, gosh, this could be the one that could bridge the gap for a lot of people that might be turned off by some of the funkier shochus, mm -hmm. and you know, they could start with nankai and then just grow have a growing appreciation for shochu as a category. You know, and then eventually we could start producing sweet potato ones and, and barley ones and, you know, aloe vera ones. Is that ones. still the, the plan? Mm -hmm. You want to do those, huh? I do, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I just love the category in general. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because in California especially, shochu is in, a, is in a great position to succeed. And it's just been difficult because of the marketing around it. So if you notice on our bottle, I think when I first met you, it was, it said nankai shochu. And it would say vacuum distilled soju oh, okay. on the front. And we changed that language, but the early first generation bottles would say that. It says what? It said what? Uh, 
Now it says vacuum distilled shoju. Yeah, and what did it say before? Soju. Yeah, so it was S O J U. S O J U, which is the Korean pronunciation. Okay, and spelling of it, right? And spelling of it, yeah. Yeah, and that's because in, in I California, think that's what people remember seeing that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's confusing. It's completely confusing. So, do you see it more spelled like how you spell it now? Mm -hmm. So shochu is the Japanese pronunciation. Um, it's the Japanese. Is it what does it mean? Something. It means burned liquor. Burned liquor? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, such, that's awesome. Which is a reference to distilled spirits. Yeah. Right. Um, that's so great. Yeah. And so, so it that, means the same thing in Korean too? Yes. Yeah. And in fact, uh, I think in Chinese too, there is, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah, there's also the same uh, characters forming the same oh, meaning. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, so in California, it's really cool because shochu, thanks to soju, can be sold at beer and wine restaurants, even though it's a distilled spirit. Yeah. It has, there's some terms, it has to be imported, it has to be less than 24% alcohol. This is 22, right? Uh, 24. 20, oh, it's right, right at 24. Right, the cost, yeah. So you can make it to those places? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. And soju and shochu, a long, long time ago, were essentially the same thing. But sometime after the Korean War, when rice became really expensive in Korea, <coughs> they, switched to, they switched from a single distillation to a multi-distillation, like a vodka. And were they still using rice and sweet potato? No, they weren't. They were using... They were using Thing like sorghum and tapioca, maybe millet, and um, when that's you where it got funky too. It got funkier and it, it wasn't the same taste, and they switched over to multi distillation because so they were using was cheaper in the grains. 50s then, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> they would have this really strong alcohol from the multi distillation, right? Ninety six percent, whatever. They would add a bunch of water, uh, and it was still wasn't quite the right taste, and so they started adding corn syrup, and it became a huge hit. Yeah, absolutely huge hit. So the number one sold spirit in the world yeah you know but it still is right it still is yeah. yeah but it's different from shochu now mm -hmm. because shochu is about single distillation highest quality ingredients nothing added ever yeah um and that's kind of what i love about it yeah it's amazing it's incredible i really really love it. i love the cleanness of it and it's so funny that i've known you a while and it's just until recently i'm really really discovering it in a different way. Oh, thank you. Because I'm not just mixing with it, I'm just having it on its own. On its own. Um, and I'm, it's hitting me on a, on a deeper level. Thank that's you, what man. I love about it. Well, it's, that's funny, it's funny that you say that because I, our way of thinking about shochu changed when I met you, you know? Yeah, interesting. Because I brought it to you thinking about cocktails or, or thinking about, you know, doing what you do with it. And then when you started to show me your process, you know, finding the best ingredients and starting with infusions and then going from there and just layering flavors, it completely blew my mind as to what I thought about cocktails. Because for me, cocktails was like, you know, uh, you know, margaritas and, yeah. and, and old fashions and, and kind of keeping it that way. But then you brought different dimensions to it with, with all that fresh yeah. flavor, you know? <laughs> I remember when you guys came to Mon Lee, was, it was, was he, the, is he, the, he was a distiller, right? Yes. Yeah, that was such an honor to have him. But, um, he really, I think, was impressed too. Like he saw it in a different way as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. And that, that was just my style. I just, you know, I just, but I think what's, I'm, I'm working backwards and you guys are working forward. Yeah, Do you well, know what I mean? Yeah, I in mean, a way, you're I think, starting from here and this and you're going towards that. I'm going backwards, you know, um, which I love, you know. Um, <laughs> and I gotta tell you, you know, what I, I just, you're one of the few people around that came to my restaurant, you know what I mean? That actually was there. I think, you know, I, I had done 61, 62 seatings here at my home, and I only did maybe 32 there before the fire. That's crazy. And I just, I'll never forget when your <clears throat> wife said that was the best uni she ever had. Yeah. She's coming, coming from a Japanese person. So yeah. that was just something that always stuck with me, and um, I just always appreciate your graciousness and, and, oh, I, no, and right. I knew like you had a real passion for this. You know, I think there's a lot of people uh, in the business who, you know, they, they switch from brands to brands to brands and they're just trying to find their way, you know what I mean? And um, this is not easy. No, you we know? learned that the hard way. Yeah, I mean, you've got to still be in the middle of this. Yeah. Know? I think there's nothing more difficult than really trying to start a brand. Yeah. Now, Sure. And especially to when there is that brand doesn't really exist that much. I mean, the category doesn't exist. That's what you know? I mean. The category, yeah. it's the category you know. Uh, yeah. I remember thinking on the oh, flight what? home that Patron Tequila was uh, was one of the inspiration points because I remember not drinking tequila 
before Patron. Mm-hmm. Patron, with its marketing, really changed the the language of tequila. I think yeah, it was for all a lot about of people, that marketing, yeah. right? And I thought, gosh, could we do maybe not on the same scale because we don't have the same kind of funding, but can we do something like that where we change the conversation around shochu, mm. you know? And I just felt in my gut that if I met people and they tried it, that how could you not like it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's just my, I don't know if and it's... And that's, that's how it's been, right? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, I think people that have tried it are kind of blown away with how, how clean and smooth yeah. and, yeah. you know, bartenders and mixologists have found how easy it is to use. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And that's something that we didn't know either. We and just, it's greater lower proof to still make for people, yeah, which people I think really want today. Yeah. Do you? Um, so, what are some of the real growing pains? You know, because I'm, I'm obviously mm. in your situation a little bit. Um, what are the major growing pains that you go through? You know, trying to get this brand out there, or just a brand? Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, the first thing was, you know, we started this completely naive about the industry. We thought <laughs> if we have a great product and we just get it out there, it's, it's just going to sell itself. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so I thought, oh, yeah, it'll just be a side hustle. You know, I'll keep my day job and, yeah. and we'll just, and you know, every once in a while, grow. yeah, we'll just sell it into markets and, and then people just will want it because it's so awesome. Yeah. But of course, it doesn't work that way. You have, it, it has to be a full time thing. And so, do you, is this full time for you? It is, yeah. yeah. I think it has to be. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where you just can't do it halfway. Mm. You know, we threw, we had a decision to make early on. Do we buy a house? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or do we give this a shot? And the the turning point for us was uh, late 2017, we got our first sample shipment. And it, back then, it was still this idea of a side gig. Okay. And then sometime around January, uh, we got introduced to um, the sommelier who's going to run the program for Major Domo, David Chang's uh, new restaurant at the time. Yeah. And we didn't think we had a chance at all. But he just took one sip and said, okay, you guys are in. And we're like, what? We are? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that kind of gave us a confidence because it was just that one sip for him to know that he wanted to do it. That we're like, okay, we need to do more of these kinds of meetings. Mm-hmm. But it would be impossible to do if we were just working our day jobs. Yeah, right. You'd have so to, yeah, you we decided, to okay, it. we're going to take our, our house money and just take a chance. Wow. And uh, yeah, that was... That's true guts to me. I mean, being you really, really left the comfort of something yeah. to pursue this. It's you know, I, I, it, there are parts of me that feel guilty because because you have children, because we have kids. Yeah, you know, I, and our, I, I our first daughter was that. our first daughter was born um, during our first. Was it? Let's see. We launched two thousand seventeen. So, she, so she was actually. I met you in two thousand eighteen. Yeah, two thousand eighteen. So she was like around one year and a half to two years when we first really got into it. Yeah. And so we kind of made a selfish choice. Now, selfish because you used your money and that's taken away from them, or that your time is going towards both. Them? Yeah, both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is a heavy time investment. It's so, it's so crazy when you have kids. You know, you, all that stuff that you go through. Yeah. You know, you're no longer making decisions for yourself. You think you are. Yeah. But you're not. You're not. No. Yeah. But, but I mean, you know, we, we still put our kids first as much as we can, of and course, so yeah. you know, I don't do. The typical. Um, how old? What, how old's your oldest right now? She's five. Five. Yeah. Okay. So you know, I always try to come home to read, read to her, or have dinner with her. You know, I don't do the the typical entertaining that you would do in this industry. I don't go to dinners and, yeah. and clubs and too, yeah. bar nights. Um, I just do the the day sales calls. Yeah. And then and then come back. Do you and, think there's a part that's hurting you not doing that, or probably. it's kind of a non-negotiable thing for you anyway? So it, you yeah. don't really entertain it. Yeah, I mean, because I don't, I don't know, I don't. There's a culture to that, and 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 I think we've talked about this at some point. Because you were talking to Southern at some point, right? They're our distributor in, in uh, Southern California. They're your distributor, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I had this whole experience. I was, you know, I was <clears throat> representing uh, Cap Rock Gin at the time. I okay. was like their ambassador for just a very short period of time. Love the product. I mean, I, I went to their farm. You know, same thing. It's, he everything comes out of love. They were biodynamic winemakers, and oh, wow. and then they started making this gin. And it was it was really my favorite favorite gin. And um, he's like Matthew, I really want you to give this a shot. Da 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 da. Right. And I remember. Um, so I went out with one of the guys from Southern. I think it was. Um, we went went out to eat, but went to talk because I really wanted to kind of pick his brain. And I guess he was the head of. Um, what is it? It's like. 
the specialty spirits. Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? Artisanal. They call it, artisanal, yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. So here they're here. We're having a conversation and he's talking about this and how you he's trying to educate me on how bottles get placed and stuff. And I don't know if I told you the story one, but he literally mm -hmm. said to me, he goes, Yeah, you know, um, you know, Lance took us out to dinner and he didn't pay the bill. And I just kind of like my, you know, my heart kind of sank. And I was like, I said to myself, this guy's not Bacardi. Like, he's a farmer from Colorado. Yeah. And what they did was they were so upset that he didn't pay the bill that they started finding ways to take the, 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 the booze that they had put into the wells of places out of there. Oh, my gosh. And when I heard that, I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is like the mafia. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. And I know, I know a lot of people don't want to say that. I, I don't care. But... It's like the mafia because I went back to Lance. I said, Lance, you got a problem here. I yeah. said, I don't think these are your people. I said, I don't know how, you, I don't think you can fix it, yeah. is what I told him. You know what I mean? And no one ever really, I think, um, got to the bottom of some of these things like that. And, yeah. you know, it's almost like maybe you think of that as networks. I don't know how you would relate it to something like that, but it's almost like you just can't believe the control that these people have. And I think you were telling me about. Albertsons. Did you get into Albertsons? Right, Albertsons. We're going to Ralph's. Okay. Um, but weren't you telling me at one point that they literally wanted you to pay for space to be in, or, or, or they asked, for, or I don't know if it was Albertsons, but people yeah. asked for you to pay for space, right? Yeah, essentially the way it is, is it's a very competitive thing where there's only so much space, yeah. and there are more brands than there are space. And so... I don't know if it's like this gladiatorial thing, but essentially... But it's always going to be that way. It's right? going to be that way. That's not going to change. So it becomes a thing of how can you get the attention of the sales guys to get into that space? And so all the major brands, you know, out there um, definitely provide incentives to get on that shelf space and to keep it. You mean like taking them out to dinner and stuff? Or, um, or, or, or just, you know, you, you pay bonuses for getting that shelf space, you know. So they don't make, the salespeople don't get commissions generally for these kinds of deals. Uh, they're all salaried. And so, in order to be more attractive to the salespeople, you have to do this incentive program. And know? what is that exactly? Um, basically, you just pay a certain amount per case. Yeah. To get on the shelf, so okay. you, you know, you say there's. So if you want forty Albertsons, yeah, you know, get me to all those forty Albertsons. What would you have to pay? What would you have to do? We would that? pay probably about twenty-five dollars a case. And each case is how much? Uh, in bottles, or price? No, I'm saying your price, price. Um, so it would be like, what, Nankai would be something like $300 a case. Yeah. Right? So you'd have to kick back 25 25 bucks. Yeah. And it's not all, it's not every case, it's just the first time. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But, but there are companies out there that pay $150 or every $200. Time, right? Not necessarily every time, but oh, okay. but seasonally. Yeah. Um, just to stay on top. And that's a lot when you're talking about 40 stores. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's something that we can't do, for sure. God, man, that just seems wrong. But, but the, so yeah, I mean, so that's the naive part of me. I didn't know that's how well, it is. Well, it is a huge part because I think what I think is amazing about this, it's not about whether something's great or not. It's about yeah, learning you know how to I mean? how to play the game essentially. Yeah, yeah. God, it's so funny. It's not that different from other businesses. No, it's not. You know, I'm, not. I'm picking on this because it's our business, but it, it really is no different. Yeah. So I mean, you you basically learn what the landscape is, and, and you work you work way around it. And yes, I mean the fact that I don't really do a lot of the night events. I do occasionally because you know we do a lot of our own events and yeah. I'll go out to other restaurants and bars just to support them, but I'm not doing the, the usual schmoozing that I think that you would normally have to do. Mm -hmm. We don't have the budget for it. We're small. It's just you mean like going and just like talking to bartenders, buying drinks, entertaining, and, yeah, and, or bringing people by, yeah, 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 I, I, yeah. Do you think that stuff works? I mean, it must. Yeah, it's kind of what typically has to happen. I think. Yeah. So do you think you'll ever get to that point, or? Is Hopefully, it, yeah. fingers crossed. <laughs> so you want to be at that point. Well, I mean, it's that point meaning, <laughs> meaning that kind of volume. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And to get that kind of volume, you have to win hearts and minds. And there are different ways to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, our way, which is kind of the organic way and, and the natural way of doing things for people with small budgets like us is is becoming friends, you know, with people and, and, and then just really kind of just working with our friends. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the part that we love. I want you to taste this quickly. So basically, because you just made me think of it. This is your soju with figs, though, that I turned into a vinegar, though. Oh, what? Yeah. This is going to go in my radish salad that's part of my new season, my new menu. So a fig? Fig. So tiger figs in your soju, uh -huh. you know? And now it's a, it's a vinegar, basically. Wow. And that's soju-based? Yeah. That's your soju. Wow. 
That's incredible. All it is is your soju and figs, fermented. Jeez, um, that's incredible. It's. But got, how cool is that going to be on the radish salad? I have all these multicolored radishes that I'm drawing. They're, you know, they're all going to be soaked in a different vinegar. Pine cone, this. So on the plate, each radish is from a different vinegar. Can I tell you something about shochu? There was a huge um, shift in shochu back in the 80s um, where somehow, maybe it was the 90s, where uh, this university professor discovered that shochu is better for your heart than red wine. And all of a sudden, people went from drinking sake to drinking shochu. Right. Sake is still more popular, right? In the U.S. No, yeah, in the U.S. Sorry, yeah. yeah, not Japan. Or worldwide, maybe. Yeah, but in Japan, sh shochu outsells sake two to one. Amazing. And because, you know, distilled spirits, there's no sugar, there's no carbs, you know, and then depending on the proof, it could be lower calories. So shochu per serving is lower calories than everything else. And when you combine that with the fact that it's better for your heart than red wine or sake. Do you talk about that? We do. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's only so many things you can say in one conversation, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, depending on what people are into, that's why I'll bring that up. Yeah. You know? And so if you have that combined with basically, I mean, this, this really healthy vinegar, yeah. I mean, you've got an incredible dressing. And so people in Japan actually use shochu for dressings because of that fact. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so they, yeah. And, and you, you organically came to that I just decision, organically so. came to it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's delicious. I knew I wanted to do, so, you know, when I was planning your dinner, you know, for the Stop Asian Hate, I was thinking of how many different ways I could use a soju, not maybe just for cocktail, but just even things, if you had a quick sip of it, I wanted to keep the whole flow of it going, but I also wanted to show them how many different ways it could be expressed. Yeah. You By know? the way, uh, I have to thank you again for, for you know, volunteering your, your time and your, and your services for supporting oh, yeah, that. I love that. You know, Absolutely. Um, that was a... A thing that is still kind of happening, you know, and, and yeah, we'll make it happen. I'm yeah, not, I'm not worried about. It. I, I just oh, no, I, I mean, I mean the, the Asian hate part of oh, things. Oh, yeah. So tell me about that. So, you know, when I got involved and I, you were telling me stories. Yeah. To me, um, it is one of the most horrifying things because it's talking about really just. I don't understand how somebody could brutalize older people that some of them can barely walk. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's really, really, really disturbing. There was a. Horrifying trend that began essentially, you know, right after President Trump, you know, started kind of talking about China being responsible for for Corona, yeah, and that somehow equated to Asians becoming responsible for Corona, you know, and is that where where you it really started the whole thing? I think so, yeah. Yeah, there's that correlation there, and and all of a sudden there was this uptick in in violence against Asians. But what is it about targeting the older? Or the people that I'm guessing really, cowardice. <laughs> I don't know. So just it was an easy Cause, prey, cause, you mean? Yeah, I think so. Because most of the people that were being attacked, you know, they weren't, you know, martial artists. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they were afraid to get a young guy. Yeah. He's gonna karate chop me. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. They were going after. They were going after older people. They were going after women. Yeah. You know, uh, people that were not even paying attention. You know, there were people Do just you standing know for a stop. Personally, that was. Yeah. Um, no, I've I've had friends definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. If it's not verbal, definitely physical or the threat of physical. You know, it's interesting because I, I think this happens so much is something will happen and it will make a lot of news and then we don't talk about it anymore. And it doesn't mean that it's not still going on. It's still going on, yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, tell me about that. You know? So, I mean, thank goodness. we don't hear about it like we did. Right. I mean, there, there are still, you know, these Asian American journalists that are, that are bringing light to it every day. Mm -hmm. And even within the Asian American community, I think there's definitely more of a concerted effort to to protect one another, you know, mm -hmm. and to not let just let slide when, when it happens. Yeah. But I think you know you know I think shining a light on it and, and making people aware that's happening is part of it, which is why I'm so thankful for you and, and lending your time to it because yeah, I think absolutely. it really helps, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I remember being terrified for my wife and kids. Yeah. You know, I would. Did I would, that happen? Did you feel? they were definitely were possible targets, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And my mother, you know, she lives by herself in North Hollywood. Um, there was a, a long period of time, even now, I think, you know, she doesn't really want to go anywhere because she doesn't know oh, what's going to wow. happen. Yeah. You know? So, um, and even myself, you know, I do these drives all the time where I'll do deliveries or I'll do events somewhere. And I never used to carry weapons with me, but now yeah. I'll, I'll carry, like, you know... Uh, pepper spray? Not pepper spray. Yeah, like pepper spray yeah. or... Um, uh, this martial art tool. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, 
<laughs> yeah. Do you know martial arts? I do, yeah. You do? I do. What kind? Uh, I did karate when I was younger, uh, a little bit of kung fu, and mm -hmm. also judo. Okay. Yeah. So. Judo is more wrestling, right? It is, yeah. yeah. Grappling. Like, yeah. Yeah. And do you still practice it? No, you? unfortunately I don't. I haven't yeah. done it in many years, yeah. so I'm definitely, uh, I wouldn't say a, a, a practitioner. Yeah. But I've had experience with it, yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but I, I do know guys, like, um, there's a group of uh, the sake sommeliers. Oh, really? They're... Um, and they're called sake men. And they go around wearing these Lucha Libre masks mm -hmm. and, um, and doing, you know, sake demonstrations and, and events. Shout out to the sake men guys, right? Yeah. Uh, but they're all judo experts. Wow. Like real experts. Yeah. Like one yeah. guy is like Olympic level. Um, famous mm -hmm. and everyone else like they're all teachers yeah and so they had this combined love of, of judo and 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 sake and so you know you feel extra safe when you're doing their events yeah. <laughs> you, this... you need to have that for your events yeah yeah do you um so how you do you go back to japan have you been back to japan at all obviously during the pandemic no. you didn't but yeah we haven't gone back in two years we used to go at least once a year because mm -hmm. um, you know uh, my wife, Mai, still has family there, Yeah, you know, um, and then uh, visiting her parents and her sisters and stuff. Um, but since COVID, yeah, we haven't gone back and, you know, we just had a, our second child last year. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So she, uh, the girl too? Girl. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she, she, still has, she still hasn't met her um, grandparents on, on oh, wow. the mother's That's side. Wild. So, yeah. It's wild. It's sad. For sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think. Hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll put together a trip. Um, I would love to go for right? sure, yeah. I, it, you know, so doing what I'm doing right now, and I really feel strongly about this, is um, I still feel like there's three places I really want to go to to, to really create an experience. And that would be Tokyo, Berlin, and Mexico City. Oh. Those are really the three places right now. Um, and I would say talk, yeah, I would say Japan. I say Japan would probably be number one for sure. Yeah, I think it's just like my fantasy would really would be to go there. You know, two weeks ahead of time, you really learn everything that you're going to use. I mean, you would have someone there that would help prep things for you because you knew what was in season. But then you would go all out for two weeks. But this is what I would do. I wouldn't do it in a bar or a restaurant. I would do it in a home. So I would continue what I'm doing here. And either find a really great home that someone's willing to um, give, you know, let yeah. me use, or an Airbnb. So what you do is you open up that Airbnb, and I do the same thing, you know, four to six. We maybe do more seating because you really want to take advantage of it. Sure. That's what I want to do. That sounds incredible. That's actually. That's really what. That's really what I want to do. I I don't have a lot of interest in going back to the culture of a restaurant. You know, I know that's going to sound funny to you because this is where your place lives, but I'm such a big advocate for getting people inspired to do this at home and more so since the pandemic as well because it's strengthening what I'm doing now, you know? I didn't, I never was someone who just like grinded every day, you know? I was always just kind of this floating artist that loved to create, but I never really had this grind and grind and grind and this gave me that. So it, it changed everything and I, I want to really empower people to do it. I'm you curious. Know? Well. What do you think your life would be like right now if you still had Mon Lee? That's an excellent question. It's an excellent, excellent question. Because it's one of those what ifs, right? <laughs> I think, listen, I had a lot of great things planned. And I think that the only, the only concern I would have had is my partners, even just before the fire, they were really trying to steer me in a different direction in some mm. ways. You know what I mean? They wanted me, like, they wanted me to do more meat. You know what I mean? Which didn't make it didn't that wasn't really a criticism to me, and um, listen, I think that place was genetically made for me. I think it had those um, those beds, and I had my own bees, and oh, bees, yeah. I had all the stuff I was foraging, and all that cactus fruit there, and I really was just getting started. But the thing is, is I'm doing that here. Yeah. So the the menus that I'm planning. So the first menu I'll send you. I, I never sent it to you, right? I don't think so. No. Okay. So it, it was ba basically very lonely. It's just like a lot of things. But now the next menu that I'm doing now is all the California kelp forest, right? The next menu that starts in February is all the dishes are vegetarian and all the drinks are meat-based. So I switch it. 
And then the, third, the fourth menu is all the depths of the ocean from tide pool to 3,000 feet. But 3,000 feet, I start with that, and it's dessert, and I go backwards. Oh, that's awesome. So that's what I'm, these are all things I wanted to do at Mon Lee. I remember, yeah. So the only thing that, I, it, it's, listen, I had so many intentions and dreams there. I wanted to bring in that amazing French chef that does these pop-ups, Laurent. I wanted him to take over brunch there. I mean, I had so many dreams, and I don't know if, um, if they would have been squashed or not. You know what's interesting to me? When I hear this, it reminds me of a story I heard about uh, this movie called um, World War Z. World War Z? Yeah, it's a, it was, it's a zombie movie with Brad Pitt. Okay, I've never heard of it. So, um, essentially, it was like this big Hollywood blockbuster, and they filmed most of it, and for whatever reason, the ending just didn't work, work for them. Because it ended on this big finale, this huge zombie fight, yeah. essentially. But what they did in the movie was, and it was quite genius, was they actually, the whole movie is all these big zombie scenes. And what they did was, in the very end, they made it a quiet thing where Brad Pitt would have to sneak around this lab and face one-on-one. And it was a very quiet moment for everything, you know? And, and, yeah. and it was actually more effective. And it kind of reminds me of you where you had these, these huge, this huge project with Mon Lee and all these crazy things happen, like a fire and a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you found kind of what you really liked about everything during that time, and now you've got this quiet space where it really works. Yeah, you know. This is more of a volcano than um, Mon Lee was. What it's do you mean just, by volcano? Oh, yeah. What's brewing inside of me and what this is much more powerful than what Mon Lee was. Yeah. And I had five people helping me at Mon Lee. I don't have anybody helping me here. I mean, it's getting pretty crazy. It's crazy. It's getting a little. Now I'm, I'm feeling a little. I'm starting to really feel it. So I don't want. To, I, I need to. I need to have some kind of break and rest. But I don't know any other way to do that. You know, it's like when you think about greatness or you think about really wanting to be great. Like, there's no balance in those kinds of people. They don't have to be forever. No. But like a, an yeah. athlete, I'm not equating myself with that. But like, if someone's going to be the, the the fastest in the world, they don't have a balanced life. Right. That's kind of what they do. You know what well, I mean? We were talking about this earlier, but I mean, you are literally the king of multitasking. <laughs> right? I don't know. But see, I don't know if you get a lot done multitasking. I mean, I think I do, and I think it's essential. But um, honestly, I wish I could do this more. I mean, I wish I could. Honestly, if I, in a perfect world, I just want to do my restaurant, and I would love to do I love filming, and I love doing that. That's always been what I wanted to do. Yeah. If I could really, really do that, I would be really, really happy. Um, but that's the only, that's the, how I feel about Monly. I mean, I, I had dreams of like um, having people do a pop up, like, you know, if Noma wanted, I even thought, like, mm. if Noma ever wanted to come to LA, that's the place, take over that for three months to six months. You know what I mean? Right. So I had all, I, they just didn't have the vision. I always felt, what I always felt like is I was talking them into it. Mm. You know, that my, I, I think what I became so aware of during the pandemic is I don't want to be around people that I have to pull up. I want people to be at my level and I want to grow with them. You know, I don't want to have to yank people up anymore. Right. And I think um, they don't have to be as passionate as I am or, or not, or we, or we, but we, there are people share different passions. You know, I don't think you have to do, but I, listen, I loved my crew at Mon Lee. Right. I love them and I loved what we did there. And I just think, you know, but I also think it was, you know, I think I've told you it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me, the fire. Right. You know? In a weird way. Yeah, very weird way. And um, again, it's all of those things that happen like that. You you just turn into somebody else you didn't know that you were. You know what? <clears throat> I think we've talked about this before, but you know when the fire first happened, obviously it crushed your soul. And, and you know, well, I was in a, I was basically in a coma yeah. for three months. Yeah. What? How did you get yourself out of that? Like, what did you decide to do one day and just say, okay, let's figure this out? I'm gonna tell you something I haven't really told too many people, which is unbelievable that happened. I can't even believe it. There's a woman that I knew for years, right? And, um, and she goes, one day I'm gonna help you, right? <laughs> and I think, so the fire started with literally, we just had the three year anniversary. It was in November. Oh my God, has it been three years already? Yeah, it was three well, years. Yeah, I guess. No yeah. November 6th, it was, it was, it was the, that's when it hit my God. place. Yeah. So it started two days before. But um, so what happened was, is I was definitely in that coma. Like, what am I going to do? And the light, nothing was really happening in Malibu. I was like, I was seeing that these people, it's going to take forever to even like get electricity on, you know? And I filmed one of my favorite podcasts 
in there. I don't know if you ever, I think I gave it to you at driving one time. You yes. heard it, yeah. Uh, this one with Allie Ward was Stologies. awesome. Because she, yeah. yeah, she came to my rubbish, you know what I mean? And we filmed it there and talked to this. So that was awesome. But I think what happened was, is I kind of came out of that and I still kept dreaming. You know, my dream didn't die. My, my heart was definitely broken. But my dream didn't die. But I, I, what's so interesting is this woman that I met and she just happened to stay in touch with me because she couldn't believe that it was her son's 21st birthday. I think it was like six years before. Mm. And I let her come as my guest when I was doing a pop-up, I think, at some hotel in Beverly Hills. And they would always come to my pop-up. She was representing this homeless guy. Homeless guy that she, she took care of his money. The guy gave me $25,000. I never met the guy. I still haven't met the guy. She was talking to him about me and talking to him about me. And um, she said, oh, yeah, Matthew's play with Brian. He goes, oh, I, 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 I want to help that guy. Give him the money. Give him the money. Wow. And she gave me the money. I drove out, I think I met her, and, I, and the thing is, is just something like that, coming from an incredible stranger, someone I've never met, this woman, the whole concept of it, there was something inside me like, this, you're bigger than this. This is like all of this stuff that you're worried about, it's bigger than that. This doesn't mean anything. That's just a restaurant. People lost their homes, you know what I mean? People yeah. lost their homes. And I think like, it's not just about the money, it's like, the gesture of that coming out of nowhere, it just catapulted me. You wow. know what I mean? It gave me this huge, huge strength. And it wasn't just, uh, listen, I was going through a lot of stuff, don't get me wrong. It was not, nothing, even, even in today when I'm talking about you and we talk about all these things, it's still not easy. Right. I just, you know, it's all, what the most important thing that I've realized is even today, it's like I have to say to myself, who do I have to become to, to do, deal with what I'm dealing with right now? It's not about anything else. It's who do I have to become to do this? Wow, that's so powerful, that, man. Yeah, that's what it is. So I always think, about, oh my God, I've got my kids and I've got this. I'm trying to do the persimmon branding. I've got all of this stuff. And it's just like, how do, how do I, what do I have to do? Because there are some days that I'm just like, you know, crying myself to sleep, you know. It feels that way. But I don't give up, you know what I mean? That's the thing. I always remember that Winston Churchill quote, which is like, you know, um, the secret to success is going from failure to failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. Ooh, I like that. And I love that too. That's, yeah. I mean... Because that's the, that's it is, is if you, did, if, you if, if you think a failure is going to throw you, you might as well throw in the towel now. Go get a job and get comfortable. Because it's not going to happen that way. You know what's funny is, so my mm -hmm. wife and I, we have these talks all the time. Yeah. You know, shochu is so hard to sell. Yeah. Um, it's hard. It's hard, you know, and, and just raising kids and, and, and doing it is hard. And there are days when we're like, what are we doing? Yeah. God, yeah. you know, and as we struggle with that and go to sleep, hugging each other or whatever, you know, yeah. and then we wake up the next morning and just do it again. And it just connects that way over and over and over again until now all of a sudden we're entering our fifth year of doing it. Yeah. And it's in the blink of an eye. Yeah. And we haven't lost a passion for it, and we haven't lost enthusiasm yeah, for it. That's the, that's the important thing. You know? That's and when so, you know it's over. Yeah. But, you know, the one thing you said, and I, this, this comes up for me, but I don't know. It's, it's a thing that I struggle with. But the one thing is I, I've never, I've been unlucky with relationships in the sense of, like, really having somebody support me. I think that is a key element to this. You know, I think that. I was always taking care of people so much that I wasn't able to fully, you know, take care of myself. And I think that as much as I miss, you know, having a partner, a true partner, like, like what you're describing, which is like, you're really in this together, you know, one time you might be more up than the other person, that's how you carry each other. Yeah. But I do think there is something about the fact that I'm alone right now. It is a powerful time. I'm not supposed to be in a relationship. Mm. You know what I mean? And, um, but I do see that, what you're talking about, as a very strong key element to really, really get through it. You know, the... <clears throat> really get through it. We're, we're getting like philosophical here, but I feel like the, um, <laughs> the human spirit is really powerful in that whatever situation you find yourselves in, yourself in, you're going to find something within yourself to take that situation and make it work for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And... I mean, we spoke throughout the, the pandemic and the stories you were telling me about how much you was hustling and just the things you were doing, it was just so inspiring, you know? Mm. And there were days, 
I remember that, so the day after I interviewed you, um, or that week, I remember feeling depressed um, because our sales weren't that great. Right after you talked to me? Yeah. 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 But then I thought about God, but you know, he's just going out there and finding. You want a little bit more? Sure, yeah. yeah. Finding people that just love your product and love what you do, and it just keeps going on and going on, and, and they talk about to other people, and that just brings you customers. And so I was like, I just gotta do what Matthew does and just make that next step forward, you know? Well, you said, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. I, um, one of the things that is, uh, I think I fixated too much on was trying to convince people who didn't like my stuff, whatever, to like my stuff. Oh, As yeah. opposed to celebrating the people that were already crazy for it, you know? I think I, I, I spent a lot of time, not during the pandemic, but before that, really kind of fixated on how do I get more people to like it? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And not only that, it's, it was, to me it was always about understanding. Like they, oh, they don't understand it. You know, there was always, that, <laughs> right. that's how I would say it, you know? <laughs> right. But it's, um, I don't know, I just, I just think that, you know, when I really looked at how many people did enjoy it. Those are the people I focused on. Those mm -hmm. are the people that I got the strength from, you know? I think, uh, so one of the things that we also talked about too during that interview on the website was um, you're telling me these stories about how if somebody didn't like something, you would kind of go back to the drawing board and find something they did like. And you were able to figure out, for example, this one lady talked about one of your cocktails and she says, this is the most incredible cocktail in the world, you know? And the second drink and the third drink she didn't like. And you're like, what is it? And you figured out it was Ginger. ginger. Yeah, very good. Yeah, right? that's right. So, do you still have those experiences now doing your private mm -hmm. dinners where if you don't get ex ex or the, 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 the private feedback? dinner, so the private dinners are di more difficult in that sense just because I'm so used to making drinks for people and now I'm doing a tasting menu. So, right. it's a set thing and I have to trust that there might be a couple of things that those people might not like mm. and I have to still go with it. So here's a perfect example. So, because I always, always am so conscious of that. And there's a little bit inside of me that wants to have something back up for them. You know, there's always going to be that side I'm the same of me. way, yeah. Yeah, there's always me. But the thing is, is for me, it's difficult for me to stick to something. Mm. Having a menu for me is, I thought was going to be constricting, but it was actually freedom. And the, the closest that I can equate that to is, is having an actor who does the same play for a year on Broadway, let's say, right? And they're doing the same play the same way, but somehow there's something in a night after night that they're finding the nuances of that, right? And that's what this is. It was every night of doing it and doing it and doing it, I would change little things. So by the time the 49th person came along or the group, that just like, you know, like when I did the, before the night of the fire, I knew it was the best it's ever been. It was, I was up to 22 courses. I made lobster ice cream and lobster jerky. So I knew it was the best it had been. So that's what this is. It, it, you keep getting uh, refined and that's, all, that's new for me too. And because I love to keep changing things, but when I kept changing things, I wasn't learning the lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was staying away from the lesson. I was just staying in the passion and the fire. I wasn't staying in the silence, what you were talking about. That silence of the zombies. Right. I wasn't doing that. I was doing the apocalypse every time. Every right. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Going for the big finale. Yeah, that's what it was like. Yeah. You know, wanting to wow people in this. And instead of um, finding all the other nuances and things like that. You know, that kind of reminds me of something, and it's going to lead to a different topic, but um, there's this huge you know, range of, of ingredients that you work with. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that really inspired me and my in our own, like, because when we, whenever we do sales presentations, you know, we always try to find different cocktails to kind of give restaurants ideas to how to use Nanka, you know? Yeah. But after a while, we start hitting a wall as to what we're going to do next. That's important, though. Yeah. Yeah, so... How, so how do, you, how do you get past that? I mean, I know you do the, the, the farmer's market walk around, mm -hmm. but the, how, do you, how do you figure out, like, for example, that, oh, pomegranates, I'm going to fuse, in, I'm going to put chartreuse in that, or... I'm going to make a saffron water with yuzu or, you know, like, where do these ideas come from? I think, I think a lot of what I do now, it does come, it do, there's, I don't want to say there's a little bit of an automatic, but I, I developed that rhythm, which I don't think anybody has that opportunity today. I really don't. I went to a bar, they allowed me to not have a menu, and I riffed four to five nights a week for four years. 
So everything was about, so what happened was I started to taste in my head. It mm -hmm. wasn't so much tasting that. I kind of had started having an encyclopedia of flavors that I could put together kind of like this. So when I start thinking about things, I'm already, I don't, ne sometimes I don't need to taste it. It's kind of like, it naturally, like this menu that I'm doing now, I woke up at two in the morning, I wrote the whole menu. I didn't even try anything. I just wow. wrote the whole menu. It was done, I was like, this is, and now that I'm doing it, there's only little things that I'm refining but it's all pretty much the same menu from the original time. So I think a lot of it is being quiet, but a lot of it is, uh, I think creativity is really always changing your everyday life of what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a professor, I think, in Italy that talked about this, that um, he would drive a different route home every day so that he didn't, it changed the chemistry of his brain, you know what I mean? So it opened him up creatively. Interesting. Yeah. But I think for you, it's just, it's, I think for you, just trying to take something that you're doing. You know, when I, if I really was going to teach somebody cocktails, the real way to do it is to say, you know, what's your favorite? Let's say we take basil. Do seven different things with basil. See if you can come up with seven different things with basil. If you can do that, you can do anything. Because wow. you're taking something that is, we know, as a point of reference, you can make an oil out of it. You can do a granita. You can muddle it. You can infuse it. You could uh, juice it. But that's the that's what I think. What I, if if you were coming to me as like a consultant, you know, saying what do I do? That's how I would unblock you. That sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. what I would. That's do. great advice. And now let's try the Persian mulberry gold. Whoa, Persian mulberry gold. So this was something I was holding off for a long time. Oh, that beautiful color. It's incredible. The Persian mulberries are the ones that really drip of juice and everything. Wow. And then we can get into persimmon. <laughs> and have you be the first civilian. Whoa. I know. That's insane. People go crazy. It tastes and, I mean, yeah. it's, like a, it's like a rich it's like, wine. I know. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to do this whole thing for your dinner where that was served in a wine glass and you thought you were drinking wine with the meal. Oh my God. That, you know that, what I mean? would, that's what I was trying to do is how do I cre make alcohol into wine? <laughs> you know? yeah, dude, that, you just did it. This is amazing. Yeah. How long does it take to make something like this? Not that long. Seven to ten days. Really? Yeah. I just let things sit because they can go past that. So maybe that has something to do with it. But with all, it's the Persian mulberries, they just drip of juice. Wow. And to me, that's what I was going for. I wanted to create this, and I, th I pictured you guys outside by the fire having a red wine, you know. This, yeah. I mean, if you search them first and then tell Didn't them say later. Yeah. yeah. Do you think they would think that was, like, you know what it is, so I'm, I'm, but would they think it's a wine or a port or a dry, maybe a dry concentrated wine? Listen, if you didn't tell me this was not like gold, I wouldn't have guessed it. Now that you tell me, I'm looking for those, those yeah. notes. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I see what you, where you got yeah. it. But if you just didn't tell me anything, I would be like, oh, this, this is a fantastic wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted, to serve it in a beautiful wine glass. Wow. I think you should still do that if you have a chance well, to. Well, I do. I, I want that to be with like a cheese, you know what, what I mean? A, what a conversation starter. Yeah. Oh, oh I'll tell you what I want to do for you. Don't, don't keep that there, right there. So what I want you to do. Don't finish that. Okay, I want, yeah, I'm going to see that. No, no, you I can have it, but I just want you to drink. Some, so drink this Manchego vermouth with it. Whoa, what? And now you're having wine and cheese. Okay. That reminds me of one of the, um, one of the Molly courses you had was the... Um, the Caesar salad, right? No, it was like a... Um, it was a double flat. It was a, it that was, was a, a liquid Caesar salad. The oh, was it, oh, was it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caesar salad. I had the Parmesan vermouth. Parmesan really yeah, it was, yeah. This is better because it's more like an Whoa. eating cheese where Parmesan is strong, right? So that's more of a 50-50. I say 50-50 like, you know, 50% of the people don't like it. It smells like butterscotch to me. Mm. It's a six, Oh, wow, man. Yeah, it's a six-month Manchego. That's As opposed incredible. to 20 months. So when you go back and forth to the... The umami in that, this. Jesus. Go on. So now you do that and then take that. Now you're really having wine and cheese. Oh, come on. 
Wow, yeah. Matthew, this is incredible. Yeah. This isn't um, so you, but I could do that. I do. I just do the Dolan Blanc, but I think it'd be great with um, the regular wow. Nankai. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that would have. I, I seriously would have been tricked. But see, the other thing too with drinks, and I, I tell people this, I, I'm always going to repeat myself a million times, but. I don't think about like making a drink. I think about all the paints, you know. So everything you look around, and I, you know, there's a lot more to do. But I think about making these things on their own, and then it's more about the inspiration of putting them together. So it's not so much like this. There are some things where like, oh, I want to make this, or I want to make that. But a lot of it is um, really things coming out of me that I didn't know. You know, like that's that's what's great about a private party. Sometimes is I'll bring all these jars. I'm starting to make like smaller jars for private parties. And I remember I did this one a couple of weeks ago. I made drinks I never made before. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? So that's awesome, right? And that only comes because I'm listening to people say what they like and what they don't like. And then I just, it's like I'm painting on, uh, on the spot. You know what I mean? Uh, it's funny that you say that because one of my, I guess, um, most popular cocktails that is kind of now our signature, we make a wasabi sour. Mm. And... Um, what do you, how, how's the wasabi in there? So he, that's, that's the funny part. So I played around with a lot of different wasabis because I'm, I'm friends with this guy who's the sales manager for this major wasabi company. Okay. And so he's giving me all these. Is like, it real wasabi? Yeah. So he's sending me all this fresh wasabi. Oh, wow. And I can get you some Is it expensive? Want. Very. Yeah. How he, much is it a pound? Uh, that I don't know. I'd um, like to get it from my third menu. I can. Yeah. I'll introduce you guys. Okay. Yeah. Does he grow it or he gets it? Uh, he brings it from Japan. Okay. Uh, and everything's frozen because he is has. Is it super spicy? No. Uh, yeah. Real, real wasabi is not spicy, not, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he even has this yuzu oil that he created where he was trying to get the right amount of yuzu and oil. Like, I mean, actual like squeezed yeah, yuzu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Okay. You would love it. Um, but uh, our wasabi sour, I played around with it over and over again. I just couldn't get it right. And I had a pouch of this uh, wasabi salt that he gave me. Okay. And I was at this um, Thai restaurant doing this pop-up with uh, this fantastic uh, sushi chef that I want you to meet as well. Okay. Her name is Ai. Amazing. Oh, that's the one we were going to yeah, work yeah, with? Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Where does she work? She has her own thing, just like you. She does yeah. it out of her oh, home. Okay, and, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, all these chefs were there uh, supporting her, and they had tried all our cocktails that we did that night, and they all loved it. Like, oh, what else you got? But I was already done. I'd given them everything. And so I was like, uh, okay, let me, let me riff for a second here. And all I had left that I didn't use was the wasabi salt. And so I just started playing around with it. I made a, a standard daiquiri or, uh, you know, a sour. Yeah. Using simple syrup, uh, lemon, nankai. And then I added uh, a large pinch of the wasabi salt. Right on top? Yeah. Not and, on the and, and then I shipped it. And then I shook it yeah. with ice. And the salt in the wasabi, and it turns out there was brown rice powder in there as well. Oh, wow. It just activated all these umami flavors. And it became an instant they hit. They loved it? It became the biggest hit of the night. So that's what they do? Yeah. Yeah. The wasabi that's salsa. That's so great. See, yeah. that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. It's all those mistakes, and it's also being under the, the pinch. Yeah. It's under the pinch when, you remember what you just said? You said a few minutes ago, you're like, people want to, they strive to succeed. If they're under the pressure, they most likely they will succeed. You're not going to be under pressure and be like, ah, I give up. <laughs> right. Because you're under pressure, right? Right, so, right. What's interesting is that's when some of your best drinks can come. Well, you know, what's funny is something that you had told me during one of our first conversations has always stayed ingrained in my mind how when you first started, your template was je was basically the, the daiquiri. Yeah. And how you that's applied you different mean. versions yeah. of that to everything else. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what would Matthew do? <laughs> <laughs> He'd throw that damn salt in there. Yeah, and, and it worked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a, thank you. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, the daiquiri. <laughs> do you want to try the persimmon brandy? Oh, my gosh, Should yes. I give you a little sip? Is that okay? Yeah, I, I know of course. I know you have a limited lot. No, so. no, no, no. I have, um, I have something I want you to... Well, first I want you to try it on its own. If, I mean, I love it as an old-fashioned with the candy cap bitters. Oh, yeah. Um, but I want you to try it. So I and this, ask is, you, uh, this is 86 proof. Okay. Yeah. How did, first of all, how did you think of Hachiya persimmons as what you wanted to use as your ingredient for this brandy? I think for me, um, I have such a love for those. It's, it's, how, it's the same way how I got into food. 
I was sick, sick of wasting all the other stuff. Like, I would make, here you go. Hmm. I would make these drinks, and I'm like, there's all this stuff left over. Mm. You know, I wish I could put them in something. I wish I could cook with them. And it's like, why don't you? You know what I mean? And I think with Hachia persimmon, there was a few things I was doing with them, but to something for, to be a brandy or a rare eau de vie, it just has to be a fruit, right? And I saw them, they were so, you know, they're so sugary and so concentrated. I'm like, this has to be, why can't we just distill it? And I had talked to um, the spirit guy, like, oh yeah, we just did cantaloupe, it didn't work so well. I'm like, I think this will work though. He goes, I said, I will buy the 2,000 pounds. So it was $4,000 wow. $4, and I didn't even have the money. You know, I just wow. said, I'm gonna do this. So they, what happened was they couldn't get 2,000 pounds right away. So they had to keep getting 250 pounds at a time and putting it in the freezer. And what happens is when you freeze fruit like that, the sugar content actually intensifies. So by the time he dropped it down the spirit guild, whatever, a month and a half later, all that stuff was just bubbling right away. I mean, it was just amazing. And they were smelling it and they said, Matthew, I can't believe it. He goes, this is gonna, this, you're on to something because this is like, the smell of this is incredible. Wow. So I fell in love with it, you know what I mean? And I think it's incredible. So I'm curious what you think, but I, I love it, love it, love it in an old fashioned. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah, of course. Wow. Yeah, I, I love it. I just think it's incredible. I think, I think a lot of people, you know, they might see the price tag and they think, oh my, they don't realize how expensive that is to make. And I think it's, I think it's incredible. The notes on this are amazing. Yeah. It's very um, custardy. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's custardy, it's apricotty, it's brown sugar. A little bit of the melat, but very. I love the feel of it. Yeah, yeah. It's got a great mouthfeel. Yeah, amazing. That's eighty-six proof. Yeah. So one of the courses that I'm trying to do, I do a small little old-fashioned with this, with the candy cat bitters, and I serve it in a frozen apple or a frozen persimmon or a frozen pomegranate. Oh. Yeah. So that's the ice cube for it. Wow, man. Do you want to try it quickly as an old-fashioned? May I? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to do it. Oh, I'm so excited for you, Matt. This is amazing. Yeah. I'm so glad you like it. Mm. Yeah. Do I have... This is amazing. This is like a... I'm getting this whole omakase thing here. <laughs> well, you know what I like about this? I don't know what I'm going to do. So it's nice to have different people you know, bring different things out of you, right? For sure, yeah. I think that's the candy cap. Mm. You need to have, I need to make this for you. Put your hand out and just taste that, this bitter. You need to have this for your thing. It's so dynamite. Whoa! Yeah. It's, there's nothing like, it's so, you know. Oh, and I also have the Blue Run 14 year for you to try. What? Really? Can I? Yeah, I have very little left, so yeah. Um, How did that start? Blue Run? Oh, yeah. Hold on one second. I'm sorry, I can't find my uh, really good thing. But I guess I have to use, I don't know what this is. Um, you know what it is, is I have a buddy of mine who I was in yoga with for years, years ago. And um, that might be too much, we'll see. And he kept seeing me with all the bottles and what I was selling, and he was just blown away. And at one point he said, hey, you know, do you want to buy a barrel of bourbon? We can sell it to you really cheap, and that might be better for you. I said, absolutely, I'd love, to, I'd love the barrel, <laughs> you know? And I found the Spirit Guild. That's how I got all connected to this. That's what I'm saying is, oh. it, was, it just was, became like this small kind of Trojan horse of getting into what I was doing. Because I needed a place to have the bottle sent to. The bar barrel, and then I was like, "How am I going to get the barrel out of there?" You know, I just didn't care though. I was like, again, it was one of those things. Like, it seemed like buying the persimmons. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. You know, I know it's right, and I'll will figure out a way. You know, and I think what happened was, um, it just the conversation got deeper and deeper and deeper until they said, "Why don't we do this together? Why don't we do? Why don't you do bourbon infusions? Why don't you take that bourbon and do your infusion, and then we'll sell the infusions." Because uh, that's essentially what I was doing, right? Yeah. Um, mm. 
th this is what it's so this is actually I should probably do it I probably should, oh that's okay well, I'll just have you try it like this it's not thank you it's so delicious though um, but that's that to me is the way to go yeah so what happened was we started doing that and then it just developed and then we uh, isn't that delicious wow man yeah. So you know how you had sent me that sales sheet? That's what I want to do. I want it to be like, here's some things about it. Why is this unique? It, it really is the only persimmon brandy or OEV that's ever been made. And it's made from organic hachias. And now that, that's, the, that's the recipe I would put on there. I think you need to sell the, the can oh, there's too. Oh, definitely. My God. It's expensive, but I can do it. You know what I mean? What I was thinking of doing is, what I really want to do is everyone that <clears> buys a bottle, I'll give them a small little thing of those bitters. And I don't care. I'll hand deliver it. So that's the next step. Like I will hand deliver it, bring every bottle kit, to everybody. Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll give them those bitters with the recipe card. You know what I mean? So that's what I'd love to do. I mean, but again, it's probably like, not appropriate for here. But I, I could, I could sell those. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you could sell those. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I've had people ask me for, for bitters. Yeah. Like unique bitters. Yeah. And that. Yeah. Wow. I could let you know what it is. And what it is, I, I basically, um, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple to make, but it is expensive. Yeah, I imagine. But I mean, people would do it. I think. Yeah. You don't need a lot. That's what's great. I mean, if you saw, I did two things of these. So. Yeah, just a couple drops, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the cool thing about the Blue Run was um, a, a friend of mine who is in charge of the Hawaii Film Fest. Yeah. He was posting all these pictures of himself. With Blue Run? With Blue Run. Um, and going, oh my God, I can't believe I got a bottle. It's the most incredible thing. And then the same day, maybe, maybe just an hour later, uh, you were putting on your story. The same thing? Yeah. And I was his like, story? Not, no, not your story, not his story, but your own about how it's released now. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so I think I texted you about that. I'm like, yeah. what, what is it? Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah, so this is the 14 years. So all that sold out, everything sold out. I know, congratulations. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Really They've, fast, right? Yeah. They're probably going to do $4 million in their first year open and pull a profit. Like, that's just unheard of. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm envious. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty wow. incredible. And that's 113 proof. It is? 14 year. 56% alcohol. I don't feel it on my throat. I mean, I felt it on my you lips. Could, you, could, you, could, it, you feel the heat. It's a little too much for me. Uh, but I but I love tasting all the flavors and the barrel and the vanilla and all that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. I actually tried uh, grabbing a bottle. And I just. It yeah. Was, it was impossible. I'll, I'll try to. I'll try to get the. I don't have any more. That's all I have, and I don't. I can no, no, try yeah. to get some of like. Thank the you for regular. sharing. Absolutely. It. Absolutely. Amazing, yeah. But listen, I, I really want to thank you for being here. Thank you so much for. Um, thank you for having uh, being me. Being my real my true number one. <laughs> and uh, I always, I love talking to you, and I really feel um, very easy to talk to you, and I love that. I, there's very few people I just feel, I just, I, I could really talk to you forever. I would, I want you to come back with your family. Um, how, I want you to kind of do a shout out for yourself. How do people find Nankai? How do we get it? Who, yeah. you know, I, want, I want you to really tell people, um, how, how, where is it? Thanks, Matthew. Yeah. Um, well, if you're in California, it's pretty easy. We're in a lot of places now, like Ralph's and Total Wine and all the Japanese markets, um, pavilions and Albertsons. Do you have any online sales? Is that even um, possible? We don't do it ourselves, but we have a bunch of partners that do, okay. um, like Total Wine, High Time, which is in Costa Mesa. Oh, yeah, that's a great place. They have, they have a great network. Uh, Umami Mar in Oakland does uh, online sales for us as well. Okay. Um, Are you yeah. in KNL? We are. Uh, we were. I don't know if we're still in there now. Okay. Um, but yeah, KNL was there too. And yeah. Um, so yeah, if you go to nankaishochu.com, there's actually a, a, a link to all the different stores that we sell at, and we'll even um, show you a store near, nearby where you live. But do you retail also in Nevada? And um, mm -hmm. okay, awesome. Yeah. 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 We just started doing re uh, retail in Nevada recently. We have a new distributor there. A uh, really cool guy who's like a sake som sommelier and and. Uh, you know, he had some hard times during COVID, so he made his own company. Oh, yeah, amazing. You know, and yeah. now he's just killing it. Yeah. Um, we do a little bit of sake now, too, and so we just we sell sake, sake yeah. to him. Okay, excellent. Yeah. 
Do you so it's nankai soju dot com or nankai shochu? No chu. Shochu. Yeah. C H U like uh. But spelled out, right? Yeah. yeah so perfect. show me the money, chew your food, shochu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much. Thank I can't you believe. So much. I'm glad you got to have a little taste of everything. I know, and this is, I mean, I'm enjoying basically a sold out <laughs> dinner because you, you can't even you can't even book it right now until next year. So yeah, thank not you so until much. February. I'm doing uh, makeups in January. I do makeups in January. People had to reschedule, but I'm pretty much taking January off. Wow. But I'm, I don't have any dates left at the end of the year. Oh my god. And I started doing. Um, two seatings on Saturday. So I would do 345 outside and seven here. So I didn't have to worry about like resetting. This was already set for the oh. next people. Yeah, so that's what I, and I only, that only came about because someone's like, these, these, this couple came in from Chicago, these young kids, they had heard me on the podcast and they said, any way you can see us inside? And I'm like, listen, the only way I can do this is if you come at 345. And I was just throwing like, done. <laughs> and they like venmo me. And at one point, it's like I'm making drinks, and I hear th- and I hear this, and I go, "What's that?" And they go, "Oh, we were just high fiving each other. We can't believe we're here." You know, <laughs> Matthew, no. congratulations, man. Oh, thank you. It's listen. It's the I, I'm this still. I'm still in the middle of it. You know, but um, I. But yes, I. I, I love what I'm doing. I love. What, I love that this has happened. You know, the podcast, but also just like. Being able to do these dinners are so fulfilling. Uh, even though it's, you know, it's tiring, but so fulfilling. I'm gonna uh, take this time, since it's public, to thank you because when I met you four or five years ago now, four years ago, right? Yeah. Uh, we were a no-name, no-brand company. I just walked up to you at Isabel when you're doing your pop-up, and you were so busy, but you still took some time to say, hey, listen, uh, Bring the bottles over here. Come meet me again at my place at Mong Lee, and I'll show you around. And you gave me all this hospitality and love and warmth um, when we didn't really deserve it. <laughs> and it meant a lot to us, and it really, it really gave us hope. So yeah. thank you so much, You're Matthew. So I, I can't, I can't thank you enough. Thank I you. I really appreciate that, and I know, I know that it meant. I could tell that it meant something to you. Yeah, thank I you. I knew how much it meant. So yeah, no, I will always support, and uh, I'm going to turn up the heat. <laughs> Because I love it, and because I drink it more now, that's kind of my thing now. It really is. That's so I really, awesome. Um, Thank you. It's really my thing to sip on, even if I just take a couple of sips. And like I said, I'm not somebody who likes to drink, but there's a, this everything I'm doing. I need sometimes I really need it, and it's perfect. You know, I just forgot to tell you that uh, next year, probably January or so, I'm gonna bring you some new bottles because we have you a repackage it. You mean? No, we have a 24% version of Nankai Gold. Oh wow! That's coming out called White Oak. And it's, it's simpler than Nankai Gold, but it's still incredible. Oh, I can't wait to try it. Yeah, and yeah. it's so simple. I think it's going to be great oh, for you. Yeah, I want to try it. Yeah. Well, listen, cheers. Good luck. Continued success to you as well. And um, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah. Come fight. Thanks. <laughs> cheers. <laughs>